welcome to Insider's Guide to the Law. I am your host, attorney Melissa Levine Pirro. I am the owner of Levine Pirro Law in Maynard, Massachusetts. Each week we bring to you guests from various fields of law to discuss popular issues and answer questions you might have. Um, while we can't give you specific legal advice, we do try to give general advice that might help you or your family. Um, if you have any questions, we do provide an address where you can mail them in after the show and we do our best to answer those questions on the following episode. So today with me is attorney Christine Budin of Levine Para Law. Christine specializes in elder law and today we're going to talk about guardianships and conservatorships. So welcome to the show, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. Nope problem. So to start off, why don't you explain to our audience what a guardianship is and what a conservatorship is? So a guardianship is a court action where um, a family member or a friend of a person who has been uh, deemed to be incapacitated by a physician may come to the court and request that um, somebody be appointed to help make decisions for that person, help make medical decisions, uh, decisions about where that person might live, um, any other decision um, except financial. And then how does a guardianship differ from a conservatorship? Well, a guardianship gives a family member or a friend authority to make personal decisions, while a conservatorship would give another person authority to make financial decisions for the incapacitated person. Okay, and what, what constitutes incapacity? So incapacity is first assessed by a physician. What normally happens is uh, there's an event that happens which either might be an illness or a fall. Um, it might also be, um, for example, a car accident in which somebody has a traumatic brain injury, ends up in the hospital, and it's up to the uh, doctor who's treating the patient to evaluate the person, go through a list of factors to determine if they're able to make their own decisions. Um, Primarily in the context of being in the hospital, it would have to do with medical care. Um, is the person awake? Are they alert? Um, are they able to respond appropriately to questions that are asked of them by the doctor? What sort of things um, or what sort of activities can they do for themselves? Can they feed themselves? Can they um, understand uh, medications, take their own medications? Other factors um, might be what's the person's um, level of involvement um, with their family. Do they have good social support from their family? Are, are they, um, you know, do they not have a lot of uh, support or family involved with them? Mm -hmm. It's a whole list of factors that would come into the doctor's sort of assessment as to whether that person is competent. And would the same person be the guardian and the conservator? It can be. Um, normally what happens is a family member or a friend will petition the court and either ask for uh, them to be appointed as the guardian or may ask for um, another family member to be appointed as the guardian or a friend. Sometimes you have a situation where there are two or three family members who are very involved with the, um, the incapacitated person and may wish to serve together as co-guardians. Um, that commonly happens where you might have something happen to a spouse and the other spouse might want to step in as the guardian, but um, want to have one of the children also serve as a co-guardian just to have two people um, involved. Okay, interesting. So I think for a lot of our viewers at home, um, they have aging parents. I mean, everyone does. So how do you tell if you think you might have a parent or a loved one who is kind of on the brink of needing a guardian? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult sort of position to be in because um, on the one hand, you know, this is the parent you've known your whole life and it's, it's a very hard thing to um, accept that they may be going through some, some changes associated with aging. But a lot of times in my practice and anyway, what I've seen are situations where um, the, the parent or parents are um, living independently in their home um, and children may come to visit at various points of the year and notice changes. Um, some of the things that uh, have come up in cases I've had are a parent who is normally very fastidious about keeping a clean home and when a child visits might notice that the, there's a lot of clutter in the house, it's very disorganized, there's piles and piles of mail that haven't been opened, um, there's bills, stacks of bills that haven't been opened that are unpaid, um, maybe a utility gets shut off because the bill hasn't been paid. Um, 
the parent uh, maybe appears not to have been eating properly or taking care of themselves. Um, there's, uh, you know, insufficient food in the house. Just signs to show um, that you know something is is going wrong and that parent's not functioning at the at the level that they were previously. So if that happens, if one of our viewers notices those changes with an elderly parent that they're visiting or a family member, what's the next step? Because clearly their parent has not been deemed incapacitated yet. No. Well, one of the well, one of the first things that you may want to do is to contact um, your local council on aging um, to get some information on home care agencies in the area. Um, you may also want to um, contact a, a geriatric care manager to get some help in the home. That's a person who can come in and assess the whole situation, assess what the parent's medical needs might be, um, what their household needs are, um, and get sort of services in place to sort of prevent something from happening in the future and try to maintain the parent in the home as long as possible. What you might want to avoid is a situation where the parent's difficulty in functioning in the home gets to the point where um, something happens, such as a fall. And that's something that I see a lot, is that the parent might fall in the home, um, end up in the hospital, and then in the hospital, that's where the diagnosis of dementia is made. Um, and the treatment team in the hospital at that point might not feel that that parent is safe to go home because they are lacking the capacity to make decisions and really um, uh, look after themselves safely, um, independently. And if that happens and a guardianship is needed, what's the process for going about getting a guardian? Well, the process really starts um, with the, the person's, with the patient's doctor, because um, you, you will not be able to get a guardianship unless a doctor um, signs a medical certificate deeming that that person is incapacitated. Once you have that document, you can then go to the courthouse, the um, probate and family court for the county where the person lives, um, and file a petition for guardianship. And uh, you can either, as we discussed, petition for yourself or yourself and another family or friend to serve as the guardians. Mm -hmm. um, you would file that in the courthouse. There's no fee to file a guardianship petition. And if the situation is urgent, you can ask for the court to schedule a temporary um, hearing. So that would be um, a hearing that you would get immediately within probably a, a week or two of filing the petition where you would ask the court to hear you quickly because you really need to get some help and a decision maker in place for the patient as soon as possible. Um, the other sort of, well the next step after that would be once the petition is filed you'll get a citation in the mail, and that's the notice of the actual guardianship, and that has to be served in hand on the uh, incapacitated, allegedly incapacitated person. So often in the context of someone who's in a hospital, that means um, a social worker or another person who's not a family member involved in the petition would hand the um, envelope to the patient, and that can be a difficult moment because that's may be the first time that the patient uh, understands or is notified of the, the pending guardianship. And, and the idea of losing your ability to make your own decisions and losing mm -hmm. your freedom is a very difficult um, issue to be faced with, especially if you're in a, an already stressful position like in the hospital. Right. And I've seen petitions for guardianship. I mean, there's a lot of paperwork involved. There is. It's not a short petition. It's a six or seven page document. Along with that, you have your medical certificate. Um, when you uh, are anticipating being appointed as a guardian, what normally you will um, be given the authority for is to make routine medical decisions for the patient. So that means um, anything from, you know, going to the doctor, um, if you, routine would be considered something like if the patient, you know, broke their arm and you had to go into the, they had to go to the hospital, you would sort of talk with the doctor and make the decision about, well, how should that be treated? Um, but if it's an issue that is um, what they call extraordinary medical treatment, yep. as a guardian, you, you don't have the authority to consent to that. So 
say in the extreme case, um, the person had to have a, a limb amputated. That, as a guardian, you could not consent to. You have to get specific special authority from the court to consent to that. So that's an understanding that even though you're a guardian, there are some medical decisions you can't make. So given how many pages the petition is and that it's probably new to a lot of people, do you recommend that they get an attorney or consult with an attorney beforehand? I would definitely recommend that you consult with an attorney beforehand um, and that if possible you do um, have an attorney prepare the documents and file them for you because not only is the petition um, quite lengthy to fill out, but your medical certificate um, that it needs to accompany your petition has a 30-day lifespan. So you have to have uh, the doctor complete that medical certificate within 30 days of the date you bring it to court to file. And that sometimes trips a lot of people up because they don't understand that. And you may have, have put in an, an hour of your time to do this petition, you get to court and the court doesn't accept it because your medical certificate's old. And so then you have to go back and start the whole process over. Okay, um, interesting. And after you file the petition, let's say somebody does this without an attorney, will they have to go in front of a judge in probate court? Yes, yes. As the petitioner, you do have to appear in front of the court to ask the court to allow your petition. Um, sometimes what happens is you will file the petition, you've notified the uh, incapacitated person, and then the court may appoint an attorney to represent the incapacitated person. This, um, under the new MUPC, um, this gives the court more authority um, to appoint lawyers for patients in more cases. Previously, it was only if there was an extraordinary issue involved, such as treatment with antipsychotic medication or the request of a do not resuscitate order. But um, now, under the new probate laws, um, the courts can routinely assign an attorney to represent an incapacitated patient. And this may be something that's unexpected for a lot of um, family members or friends that are trying to pursue this on their own because all of a sudden it's not just you going in front of the court to ask for this. There's a, a lawyer representing the patient and the lawyer may not see the case the same way that you see it. Um, for the lawyer, for the patient, their job is to advocate for what the patient wants, not what somebody else might think is in the best interest of the patient. So this might lead to an unexpected um, contest in the guardianship and um, more than likely the attorney for the patient may put an objection on file. So then you're not looking at an uncontested case, but you may have um, a contested motion hearing, which could lead to uh, an evidentiary hearing, which is a mini trial. Um, and that's something I think that a, a non-lawyer family member probably would not anticipate. Right. And I mean, there's pitfalls to, you know, having a contested guardianship because you're held to the same standards as an attorney. You are. You are. You are held to the same standards as a lawyer. You have to represent yourself. The court just assumes that you have the same knowledge as an attorney in proceeding with the case, which of course you don't. And that makes it very, very um, difficult and um, very, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on the family member who's obviously only trying to do what's right for the parent. So what happens if it is contested? Could your case go all the way to trial? Your case could go to trial, but normally um, what the, everybody makes every effort to do and what the court really wants you to do is try to settle the case. Okay. Um, and you're re, you normally would have a hearing, um, I'm sorry, a meeting before your hearing to see if you can all get together to resolve any issues. Um, at at least what you would want to do is try to come to an agreement on as many issues as possible and then just have the court hear the few issues that you, you just can't come to an agreement on. And is it common for other family members to contest guardianships? It is. It is. And sometimes it's um, not, it's very unexpected because not only when you file a guardianship petition do you have to notify the um, Incapacita allegedly incapacitated person, mm -hmm. you have to notify that person's heirs. So um, that may be, well, normally it would be the, the person's spouse, um, children. Sometimes um, children are spread sort of all over the place, not really living close to the incapacitated person, and they're quite mm -hmm. surprised to hear that mom or dad is, is having issues and, and may not agree that mom or dad is having issues. Right. And um, a lot of, quite often in cases, you see families that were a bit 
fractured before this event took place with the parent's illness and that um, the, the, the situation of the guardianship only deepens the rift between the family members and that can lead to, to very contested proceedings. Okay, thanks. And you mentioned the MUPC. Can you explain just briefly what that is? So that is um, an over, that's a new set of laws that completely overhauled the probate system um, from the way it used to be. And um, now it, in one sense, makes um, a guardianship uh, process easier to understand because it's a very clearly defined set of um, rules that you have to follow and procedural rules as well. Mm -hmm. But it also um, uh, sort of creates a lot of paperwork, which makes it more confusing for somebody to figure out, well, what documents exactly do I need for this hearing? And is do I need an updated document? Do I need an affidavit? So it makes it um, a little bit more time consuming. And is the process for conservatorship the same as a guardian? So the process for conservatorship is very similar. You also need a medical certificate from a physician. Um, you, um, as the conservator, you need to s disclose um, the amount of assets that the person has, that as far as, as to your knowledge. And based on that, you need to file a bond with the court. As a guardian, you need to file a bond as well, but that is normally a bond with no fees. And basically, it's your statement to the court as the guardian that you're going to act in the um, allegedly incapacitated person's best interest and make all decisions that are best for them. Mm -hmm. But um, for a conservator, because you're handling funds, um, you need to get Normally, you need to get one of two types of bonds. You can get a bond with personal sureties, which means you get two people to sign with you mm -hmm. to say that um, you know if if you mishandle that person's money, they will put up their money to to cover your mishandling of the funds. Or more commonly, especially with very large estates, um, you will be required to get a surety bond from a company um, that issues corporate bonds. So. You will need to pay a fee on your bond every year that's based on the amount of money that's in the estate. And uh, you need to continue to pay that fee every year until you're released from um, your duties as conservator by the court. So that's, um, from the outset, that's the major difference between a guardianship and a conservatorship in the filing process. Um, for a conservator, once you are appointed as conservator, the first thing you need to do is to file an inventory. And this is a really important document that quite often a lot of people who may not have counsel may not understand the need to file this. But this, this inventory is basically a snapshot of the person's estate as mm -hmm. of the date that you're appointed as the conservator. Mm -hmm. And um, on the inventory, you need to list um, all items of um, personal property that the person has, and this means everything, stocks, bonds, bank accounts, um, personal belongings such as furniture, jewelry. Um, you also need to list any interest in real estate that the person has. Um, and that inventory becomes the basis of the accountings that you're, that you're going to have to produce mm -hmm. later. Um, after the inventory is filed, then you have a duty to file every year an accounting of the estate. And you file that at the probate court. And basically, that is a listing of all of the um, funds that came into the estate during the year and all of the expenses that you paid during the year, and then the balance that's left over. And then that carries over to the next year. So it's very important that you file um, accountings every year because as the conservator you're responsible for for handling that person's funds um, and a lot of quite often a lot of times it's very easy to kind of get behind in those accounts yep. um, because they're not easy to do and they're very time consuming and um, it you, you need to file them every year so would it make sense when you're you know applying petitioning for a guardianship to also petition for the conservatorship at the same time um, if the if the incapacitated person has um, a significant amount of funds, yes, that's often the case. You would need to. Um, basically, when the doctor fills out the medical certificate, the doctor has to make two determinations. They have to determine, uh, well, they have to uh, deem that the person is unable to take care of their personal and medical decisions and also their financial decisions. Um, competency is not sort of a cut and dried black and white concept. 
Um, people can be competent to make some decisions, but not competent to make other decisions. You could have somebody who's competent to handle their um, sort of weekly spending money, but not really competent to handle large amounts of money that has to be invested um, mm -hmm. and um, you know make those investment decisions. So um, competency is also a fluid thing. It can come and it can go. So that's the reason why we have the 30-day window on the medical certificate, because you could be incompetent at the beginning of the month and then have regained competency by the end of the month. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, basically, can we cut now? No. Um, so about guardianships, um, are there any special skills required? Can anyone just be a guardian? So as a guardian, um, no, there's no special skills that's required. You don't have to attend any, the court doesn't offer any training classes or any seminars on how to be a guardian. Um, quite often it's the same things that you would be doing as, um, as a child of an aging parent anyway. You may wish to um, watch over your parents' um, living situation. Um, you may, um, well, you definitely need to be in contact with doctors. Mm -hmm. And this is something if you don't have a guardianship and you have an, an aging parent, um, that would be very difficult to do because under HIPAA laws, you may want to call the doctor and say, hey, there's, a, there's an issue, I really need to talk to you, but they won't talk to you because of privacy laws. Mm -hmm. So once you become a guardian, then all you would need to do is forward a copy of your decree to the medical provider, and then they will speak with you. Um, does it cost anything out of your personal funds to be the guardian of someone? Um, no, it doesn't cost anything out of your personal funds. There's no fee to file the guardianship petition. Um, so you can just go to the court and, and file it and not have to outlay um, any of your funds. Um, with the conservatorship petition, there is a fee. Um, but if it's a fee that you've paid out of your pocket, once you're appointed as a temporary conservator, you can then reimburse yourself for any fees that you've laid out in advance. And any money you authorize, let's say as a guardian, you sign the incapacitated person up for home care or something like that, that wouldn't come out of your funds either. It would come out of their funds, correct? That would come out of um, the incapacitated person's funds, but that's where a situation where you definitely would probably need a conservator because you would have to have somebody who is authorized to pay bills. Um, if the parent's unable to make that financial decision on their own or pay bills, um, then you would need a conservator to step in. So uh, the guardian would, would have the job of locating the home health care service, putting the services in place, and then the conservator would be paying the bills for the service. I guess as we're wrapping up here, are there any you know, pitfalls or anything that people need to look out for when going to become a guardian or conservator of a loved one? Well, I think the, the number one um, issue is you know, your, your job is to act in the best interest of the parent or the loved one. Um, and that normally is a job that you would do anyway. But as a guardian, you, once you file that bond, you are, you've given your word to the court that you are always gonna act in that person's best interest and you can't allow your own um, sort of judgment about what might be best for that person. Um, mm -hmm. You have to look at all the circumstances um, in the case and sort of make an objective determination of what um, is, is best for them. You also, as a guardian, every year you have to file a report with the court that details exactly what, you, what steps you've taken for the person throughout the year, what their needs are, how you plan to meet those needs, and that's a way that the court sort of keeps an eye on, on activities, um, your activities as a guardian. Well, thank you so much, Christine. I mean, this was extremely informative. I hope our viewers are able to take a lot away. And for everyone at home, thank you for tuning in, and we welcome you back next month on Insider's Guide to the Law. Thank you.